Hi, this video is going to look at The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe, 19th century American writer, who did a lot to define and develop the short story. In this particular story, he deals with sanity and insanity, and the structure is quite interesting because it involves a lot of particular play with language and uh, some images of uh, the watch and some references to senses. And of course, he's arguing overtly to his reader, who may also be somebody in the criminal system or somebody in, in the hospital. We're not really sure who he's talking to. Uh, he's arguing that his senses are working properly and that his reasoning is good. When of course, every so much of what he suggests to us is that it's not good. So we have this narrator who is saying that he's sane and that what he's doing is really tricky and smart, and yet the narrator is quite unreliable because we can see that he's not really that smart. He's, he's not really sane. So he uses all of his cleverness, perhaps, in a way that is really inappropriate in a deep way uh, that is inappropriate in the sense that he kills somebody based on his very paranoid absurd fear of the person's eye. So, you know, he's saying that what he's doing is, is right and that he's smart and that he's clever and crafty and that he's calm, but we can see throughout that he contradicts himself. So that, uh, first of all, he's a very unreliable narrator. And second of all, he's an interesting study in the type of mentality that is really going off the rails and doing things that are, are completely wrong. You can see this in the language, and I've color-coded the text so that you can take a look at the structure um, from a visual point of view. And you can see right at the very beginning, he starts off with syntax, which is very broken. And syntax means word order. And it's all, it's broken, and it's not the way you would normally begin a story. You might begin a story, you know, in a stereotypical way. Uh, it was a dark and stormy night. I think Snoopy in Peanuts tries to, to write stories that begin that way. And uh, it's a sort of a stereotypical way, but it's indicating that at the beginning of a story, you generally set the scene. You generally, because we're so dependent on space, you generally tell people where it is. You set the scene. You know, you, you show people the setting. And here you don't have anything like that. You just have these emotional um, exclamations and these ideas that are thrown at you. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous. I had been and am. See, the, the wording is really awkward to put and am at the end of a sentence like that. And also true, nervous, very, all of these aren't fitting in a smooth sentence. And so... It's interesting that he ends this sentence by asking the question, but well, why will you say that I am mad? Well, as we read that sentence, we think, well, there's something definitely not right about the way that you're talking. So, you know, well, why, why are people saying that he's mad? And then he admits, it seems, to having a disease of some sort, but we don't know what it is. I guess, I'm, you know, in the long run, looking at the whole story, it seems to be paranoia or something. Uh, the disease had sharpened my senses. So what disease sharpens your senses? Not destroyed, not dulled them. So, so you're, you have a disease that makes your senses so sharp that they become over sharp in a sense. But the problem is that it comes from a disease. So, you know, we know right away that there's something definitely wrong here and the person is justifying themselves. Above all, was, and again, above all was, is a very old-fashioned way of putting things. Um, you know, we might say, above all, my, my sense of hearing was acute. And the was would be much later in the sentence. But if you put it in this way, it makes it sound grandiose. It makes it sound, uh, as we'll see, more and more megalomaniacal. So above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. Okay, here we have to pause and think, well, I don't know, how often do you hear everything that's in heaven and earth? Well, probably not very often, right? So 
he's got a, an enormous sense of his abilities, of his, of his sensory abilities, and we know that those, that can't be true. Um, and so, you know, when he's talking about how acute his senses is, are, his senses are, and he says that he hears everything in heaven and earth, we go, well, okay, well, that's, there's a big contradiction here. Uh, maybe you're hearing too much. Maybe you're hearing things that aren't there. And then he says, I heard many things in hell. And in the big cosmic uh, frame, uh, which comes from uh, Judeo-Christianity, largely the way that we think about it, uh, hearing many things in hell is generally not a good thing, right? Um, and that he separates that off suggests, oh boy, maybe he did hear some really bad stuff, or maybe he is identifying something that he's hearing um, as coming from a really dark, nasty place like hell. And that kind of explains why he would kill this old man, right? Well, it explains it in some really obscure way that we don't really know where it's coming from. How then am I mad? Well, there's a whole bunch of things that he just said that could make you pretty feel pretty confident that there's something deeply wrong with him. Um, and so it's, you know, he's, he's asking the question, well, how does that make me mad? I, I, he's thinking that it's a rhetorical question that oh, you, you should answer, well, no, that sounds perfectly reasonable to me. But he just said all those things, which are crazy, right? So, well, and you don't know where to start because there are too many possibilities of the craziness, right? So, I mean, Poe has packed in a lot in just an opening, very short paragraph. Even the language is, the archaic nature of the language is often uh, suggestive of some sort of grandiose stand, hearken. I mean, how often do you tell your friends to hearken, right? It's, it's really old fashioned. And observe how healthily. And now he's as the many parts in um, purple, I'm not purple, in pink, um, suggest that he's trying to argue that he's sane. Um, and here he brings up this idea of that he's not destroyed and that he's healthy. But And so I sort of put that in, in red because it, it really underscores the part where he says that he's healthy and that he's hearing acutely. And he'll... At, the other parts, you'll see that this sort of turns into pink, where that it's constantly contradicted, right? Um, you'll see that in red, it really shows that he's he's not healthy because you know what he just said wasn't wasn't uh, a product of a healthy mind, and what he's saying about being having hearing that is acute is clearly too acute, right? And so when this comes up, this acuteness and this idea that he's healthy or logical, um, from now on, it'll be um, a really disturbing justification of what he's doing. And sometimes it's it's really obvious that he's trying to say that he's sane, and I've got that in per pink, um, and other times uh, we can really clearly see that when he's saying these things, it it's, it's almost the opposite. So I guess the reason I put it in red here in the first paragraph, acute and healthily, is that right away we know that, that there's something the matter with the acuity and that he's not healthy in his thinking. So anyway, those are the, the, uh, the different uh, colors that I'm using in addition to time and sound. And Time and sound is uh, really important toward the end of the short story. It's, it's just sort of indicated a little bit because we hear things in time. But, and of course, we, we, we get the sound of the clock. And so he, his, his hearing is really important. He says it's acute at the beginning and he hears things. But what we can see is that he hears things that are insane. And then later... Uh, this hearing gets connected to a clock in terms of time and the beating of a clock, which becomes the beating of a heart, which he believes, in a sense, is outside of him first. And he, he thinks all of the problems come from this, 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 this sound that seems to come from the walls or it comes from hell or it comes from the old man. But really, it seems to, at the end, we realize that it comes from him 
and that it's within him. All of this sickness is within him rather than um, on the outside. And you can see that uh, he's focusing all of this negativity on this man. And he see, says that he has the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so he decides that he will kill the old man to get rid of the eye. And this is all, um, you know, indicating the insanity of his thinking, that he would kill somebody because the eye. And this old man never insulted him. Uh, he didn't want his money. It was just the eye, or at least he thinks it was the eye. And so there's a little bit of doubt there. Um, but he does focus all of his his, his fear and his rage on that eye, even though it's interesting. He says, I think it was his eye, but later, you know, we find out that it's not the eye. It's, it's something within him. And so that kind of makes sense that he would only think it was. And here, you know, he goes back to professing insanity. You fancy me mad, but madmen know nothing because look what I did. I did it so wisely. And here time starts to come in again. Because every night at about midnight, he comes in so slowly. And, you know, he keeps saying how it's very normal, or, you know, how, or not normal, but how, how smart he is to do this. And, and we're thinking, well, some guy comes into the old man's room every night at midnight, really slowly, and then very slowly opens this cloaked lantern to put a tiny, tiny ray of light onto the man. We think, well, that's cunning. Okay, it, it, it may be... Uh, intricate or it may be um, specific and he may be doing it carefully but it's not smart it, it doesn't have any reason behind it um, so the whole thing is done in an ext extremely accurate way but it's all in the service of an in of an insanity right and so you think well why does he do it he puts this single thin ray upon the vulture eye and he does it for seven long nights and so the idea of time kind of important here um, and so on the eighth night, he comes in, and here he brings in the watch. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than, than did mine. And so the watch is brought up here, and it's mentioned a number of times. Uh, for example, even you get uh, the sound of a death watch. So not only do you get this idea that the that he's, he's interested in time and he's moving as slow as a minute hand does, right? A, minute's, a minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. So he's moving very slowly. He's comparing himself to a watch. And then also in the room, uh, he says, uh, and in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening there. He, the old man is set, sat up in the bed and now... They're facing each other in the dark. And for a long time, for a whole hour. And so here again, time is really important. Just as I have done night after night, hearkening, listening. And notice the word hearken comes up because it came up here. Hearkening, listening to the death watches. And these are beetles in the wall. Okay. Now it's true that he may actually hear beetles in the wall. Right? They may make a sound. But... Here you've got this idea that, that the sound he's hearing is possibly from hell, possibly connected to the Death Watch Beatles. And it's beautiful that he uses the idea of the Death Watch because he's really watching over this man and he's intending to kill him. Um, and so we've got some very odd connections that are quite kind of vaguely spooky. And, and Poe can be a very unnerving writer. Similarly, you know, he said at the beginning that he heard all things in hell. Well, and here this, this image of the Death Watch, or this idea of the beetles in the wall that he's listening to. I mean, why on earth would he listen to them? Uh, you know, maybe they just happened to be there. But he does highlight this point. And then, finally, the old man groans. And it was a groan of mortal terror. So he kind of knows that there's something deep down that's horrible here. It was the low stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. Now, this is understandable that the old man would feel this because he feels a, a, a mortal threat in his room in the middle of the night. And he's right. His senses have, his spider senses have 
caught this, right? Um, but it's interesting that the narrator knows this sound so well, because remember he talks about knowing things all in all things in hell, and he says that this sound arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. Now that's not something that everybody would agree with. He knows the sound well, he thinks it's normal, but it, it gives a clue to the whole story in the sense that he believes there's a, a sound that comes from the bottom of the soul when it's overcharged. And when it, the word awe could be, you know, positive or negative, right? Awe sometimes is, is positive, but also it can be kind of dreadful as well, right? And so when he kills the old man and he still hears this sound, then it's probably the sound that arises from the bottom of his soul when it's overcharged. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world swept, slept, it has welled up from my own bosom. And so really clearly uh, he's even making that overt is that he understands it with its dreadful echo, the terrors that distract. Okay. Um, uh, when all the world slept, as well up from my own bosom, deepening the terrors that distracted me. And he brings up the idea of death. And he starts to see himself as death approaching the old man. Uh, death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And notice how he kind of almost detaches himself uh, from his act. And he, and he says, death is doing it. Well, he's doing it, right? So he waits and waits and waits. And then he throws this eye like the threat of a spider shot from out the crevice and fell full upon the vulture's eye. And then he realized that the eye was open. And so I guess if it's not open, he wouldn't kill him. He would wait. But if it is open, he sees the full horror of the eye. And then he decides to attack. Well, probably the, eye, the man, if you look at it, if you're in the middle of the night and somebody's creeping into your room, and now you've got proof that there's somebody that's been sneaking into your room with bad intentions, probably, uh, you know, your eye would probably be quite frenzied and, and, and frightened and, and in, a, in, a, in a defense mode, so probably pretty aggressive. Um, and so he sees that eye open, and, uh, you know, then, of course, he's, he's got to, uh, to, to kill him, uh, at least by his logic. And there came to my ears a low, dull, sound, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. So now... This sound is the old man, and it increases his anger as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. And so he moves at the old man, and it gets louder and louder, and he eventually uh, opens the lantern and leaps toward him and kills the old man. Uh, I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done, but for many minutes the heart beat on with a muffled sound. And so even though it was the beating of the old man's heart, he kills the old man, the beating continues, but it didn't bother him. His eye would trouble me no more, but this is really premature because it will bother him. And now he spends a whole paragraph pointing out how um, smart he was uh, when we know that the whole thing is really insane and violent and horrible, right? Um, and so now he's with the police and it's, he's, he's overacting with the police. The police are just sitting there. We know that the police are just sitting there waiting for him to show something. Sort of like Columbo. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the TV show Columbo where he, he'll just spend time with the person who's guilty and that person will eventually give clues. Now, the clues are probably pretty obvious to the policeman. And this is actually probably more like the story that uh, Dostoevsky writes in uh, Crime and Punishment where... This young guy kills a woman and he feels so guilty about it that he goes, he basically goes to the police, goes back to the police until he finally confesses to the police. And so I don't think this is what this guy's doing here exactly because it's probably, well, it may be a bit of both. Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, maybe it's actually more like the Columbo situation where the person doesn't want to. Uh, confess, but they're giving away so many signals uh, that they're, they've done something wrong that a really smart policeman would just sort of sit there 
and spend time with them and watch and see how the person behaves. Now, and, I, and in a lot of cases, at the end of a Columbo episode, the person will finally uh, admit that they did it wrong. But here, it's a little bit more like the Dostoevsky one in the sense that the police don't really accuse him. Um, they, you know, whereas Columbo would would tell the criminal, the, the, the person who did the murder, uh, that they did it. And then the person would generally confess. Whereas here, it's a little bit of a mix between uh, the Columbo and the Dostoevsky. Here, the uh, person who did the crime is, is sending out those signals, uh, as in Columbo, but more like in Dostoevsky, he actually admits and he, he comes to um, confession uh, of his own free will in a sense. But of course, he's, he's so insane that none of this is, uh, you could ask whether he's really operating under free will because he's so, he's so ill, he's so mentally ill that everything he does is insane. And so you kind of wonder, well, did he, is he responsible? Does he have any free will? Um, or is he so completely controlled by his paranoias that he kills the old man, first of all, which is insane, and then he puts the body under the floorboards, and then he acts, you know, tries to act completely normal, but he, he overdoes it, and he gets more, just, you know, more and more agitated, and the police are just sitting there waiting for something to show them what happened. And so he gives himself away in that way, but then he also, he gets so worked up that he has to confess it. He says, you know, I felt that I must scream or die. And notice he, we still got the sound that he keeps hearing. And of course, it's the telltale heart. It's the heart that he killed. Um, and then the conscience that he feels in his own heart, which, and of course, the heart beats, right? Um, and the clock beats in a sense. A clock ticks and a heart ticks, if you like. And so he's hearing in, in something inside him that needs to confess. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. And so here he's saying to the police that they're acting. They're, you know, they're, they're pretending that everything's fine, but they're, they're, they're looking at him. And in a sense, probably looking at him as if he were guilty. So he's saying, look, don't pretend anymore. I admit the deed, tear up the planks here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. And of course we know if they take the floorboards up that the heart will not be beating. But, and we know it's his heart. So it leaves us again with the clear image um, spatially of him, you know, saying that this heart under the floorboards is beating and we know it's not. And we know therefore that it's probably his heart. It's that he imagines this beating to be in the other person. And so therefore, he's pretty clearly insane, which also leads to the really inter interesting question, leads to the interesting question is, you know, is he culpable? Uh, he seems to know what he's doing. He seems to know the effect on the old man. And yet, at every stage, he seems to be um, unable to grasp reality as most people understand it. But anyway, uh, in very interesting, complex, also really quite tight and short, short story by Edgar Allan Poe.